lecture here. Um, my name is Sunil Sinha. I'm a professor of physics at, at UCSD. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, course on uh, uh, neutrons in soft matter science. Uh, as you will see, the course contains not just neutrons, but also light scattering and several other topics, but is generally going to be concerned with soft matter. And um, I think uh, before I go any further, I should uh, uh, thank uh, Mayun uh, uh, Smith, uh, Chang Smith, to, uh, who has done an enormous amount of work to uh, put this uh, course together. And I think we owe her uh, uh, a vote of thanks. Uh, and I hope uh, that this first lecture, which is, uh, I guess I'm the, uh, I'm the guinea pig here to try it out. I hope it goes well for, uh, uh, and, and, and smoothly. And uh, so um, oh, I see some students have come in, so um, please sit down. <laughs> you, you can't see them because the camera is on me. Um, and um, uh, so let me just say that um, this course um, is going to be concerned with uh, basically uh, soft matter, and you will see that involves polymers, um, microemulsions, um, uh, disordered systems in many ways, and so forth. And um, I'm supposed to give you the introduction, but of course, um, Everything I say is going to be amplified. You'll probably hear it again in more detail in subsequent lectures. So um, I'm just going to sort of set up the, the basic uh, uh, formalism and introduce you to the subject. I'm going to assume that um, many, if not most of you, are um, new to this subject. So I'm going to start from the uh, beginning. And um, so let me, um, let me proceed and go to the first uh, slide here. So the plan for my uh, lecture uh, will be, um, uh, first of all, I want to tell you why neutrons are important in the study of soft matter. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the basic properties of the neutron and neutron sources. Uh, I then will define uh, what we mean by neutron cross-section. I'll discuss the uh, kinematic theory of scattering, which is the otherwise known as the Born approximation, the first Born approximation. And then I will discuss uh, coherent and incoherent neutron scattering, cross sections. And uh, then I'll discuss what is meant by the structure factor and the pair distribution function, which you'll hear more about later in this course. And then I'll go on to discuss particular techniques in neutron scattering, starting with small angle neutron scattering, or SANS. And if I have time, I'll uh, also, uh, in today's lecture, discuss uh, reflectivity and surface scattering with neutrons. So um, if you have any urgent questions, um, uh, you can put them in the chat, and uh, uh, Mayun will alert me that there is a question. I'll try and answer, the, interrupt my lecture and answer them. Otherwise, um, perhaps you can ask me uh, questions uh, at the end of my lecture. But feel free to interrupt me if it's uh, something that you need to know immediately. OK, so. Um, So first of all, let me, um, let me discuss the advantages of neutrons. Uh, in the first place, they are penetrating probes. Uh, they have far less absorption by materials than, for instance, x-rays, uh, unless you get really high energy x-rays. So the, you have to get up to 100 kilovolt uh, x-ray beams to get uh, comparable penetration as you get with neutron beams. Uh, and uh, they are uh, very non-destructive. They're um, they are low energy thermal neutrons, so they don't produce any radiation damage uh, on the material. This is particularly important for soft material materials. Uh, they have the correct wavelength and the energy to study structure and uh, excitations in, in condensed matter, because uh, as you will see, the wavelength is of the order of uh, 
uh, a nanometer or less, uh, and um, the energy is of the order of a few millivolts, and that's exactly very well matched to the uh, to the uh, uh, length scales and and energy scales of uh, most condensed matter excitations. They can also, uh, because a neutron has a tiny uh, dipole, uh, magnetic dipole moment because of its spin, uh, it can also be used as a magnetic probe. But we will not discuss that in this course because I'm primarily concerned with soft matter, so we will not discuss magnetic scattering. Uh, another advantage is because of the uh, vast difference between the uh, scattering coherent scattering cross sections for hydrogen and deuterium. You can obtain uh, strong contrast matching by uh, deuterating selected parts of your sample, and we'll talk more about that later on when we discuss small angle scattering. Also, there are weakly interacting probes, uh, so the Born approximation is valid. The kinematic theory in general works, uh, except for one exception, that is when you're getting close to total reflection from a surface then one has to go beyond the bone approximation, but most of the time it, 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 it's good. And um, because it's weakly interacting, we don't have to consider uh, usually multiple scattering effects, which are very important for electron scattering experiments or electron diffraction, for instance. Finally, um, as you probably know, it's complementary to many other structural probes, such as the scanning probe microscopies like STM, AFM, and so on. And uh, um, the, the difference is that uh, a scattering experiment gives you global statistical information, so you don't have to sort of go into the, all the images and select uh, or digitize them and then analyze them. It gives you that global statistical information at one shot. It doesn't, of course, produce pictures. Um, and also, because of the penetrating power, uh, you can study buried interfaces and study the depth dependence, which you can't do with surface uh, scanning probes. And uh, unlike uh, things like um, many other probes, it, uh, uh, neutron beams, just like X-ray beams, are uh, impervious to sample environmental conditions, uh, applied magnetic fields, electric fields, and so forth. Uh, the beams are unaffected, and so you can apply these to your sample while you're doing the experiment. OK. I uh, just wanted to remind you that uh, the Nobel Prize in uh, Physics in 1994 was given to two of the pioneers in uh, neutron scattering, uh, Bertram Brockhaus from Canada and Cliff Schull from MIT. And um, they um, uh, really pioneered uh, a lot of um, the work that's uh, continued today. For instance, uh, Schull showed uh, that you can do uh, magnetic diffraction with neutron beams to study uh, antiferromagnetism and thereby for the first time uh, reveal the structure of antiferromagnets and many other materials. And Brockhaus uh, developed the technique of inelastic scattering, uh, particularly with a triple axis spectrometer, which is pictured here. Um, uh, so. He, um, uh, he uh, showed that you can study uh, excitations by inelastic neutron scattering, and we'll talk about that later in the course. OK. Um, now, um, uh, some of the uh, historic accomplishments with neutrons, and these are not restricted to soft matter, as I said, are the solution uh, of antiferromagnetic structures. We, we wouldn't have any information about these without the existence of neutron scattering, uh, the existence of spiral structures in rare earths and other spin structures, the measurement of spin wave dispersion curves, um, the measurement of, uh, let me just uh, get this here, phonon dispersion curves, the study of magnetism and superconductivity, a uh, whole understanding of the basis of exchange interactions in solids and the details, the study of uh, quantum crystals and anharmonicity, uh, crystal fields, excitations in normal liquids, rotons in superfluid helium, the first measurement of the condensate fraction in, in superfluid helium, and so on. 
Now, in soft matter, uh, for instance, uh, we owe um, the whole um, scaling, the verification of this, uh, for instance, Degen's scaling theory of polymers, uh, for which he, uh, one of the things for which he got the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, to uh, neutron scattering experiments, which verified many of the predictions, um, verified uh, the um, and studied the behavior of reptation in uh, polymers. Uh, studied, uh, we've been able to study alpha and beta relaxation in glassy systems, a study of surfactants and membranes. Uh, the structure of the ribosome was actually solved finally with x rays, uh, with two angstrom resolution for which uh, three people got the Nobel Prize recently. But the original uh, broad structure of the ribosome was obtained by a series of clever contrast matching experiments uh, with small angle neutron scattering carried out by uh, the group from Yale at Brookhaven National Laboratory in the 70s. Then, of course, there, um, uh, we can study excitations and uh, phase transitions in uh, uh, confined systems, for instance, uh, porous glasses, uh, riplons and superfluid helium, helium films, uh, the study of momentum distributions by uh, deep inelastic neutron scattering, and the study of many studies of materials, precipitates, steel, cement, and so on with small angle scattering. And recent applications have included, um, for instance, um, uh, the study of, um, uh, for instance, uh, 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 mo uh, proton motions uh, in, in carbon nanotubes, protein dynamics, uh, glass transitions in polymer films, and, and many other things that you can see here, lipid membranes and so on. So these are many of the sort of applications in soft matter that neutrons have made and will continue to make, hopefully. And hopefully some of you uh, will take part in these in the future. Um, so, uh, as a final comment, let me just say that uh, neutron-based research can also uh, help us to understand uh, in nanoscience uh, how the constituent molecules self-assemble to form nanoparticles, how these self-organize into assemblies, how structure and dynamics leads to function, and how emergent or collective properties arise. All of these things can be studied. By the way, many of the things that I say about uh, neutron scattering also uh, are, of course, true for X-ray scattering. Uh, but since this course is concerned with neutron scattering, I will I will concentrate on the on the neutron aspect of things. So here is um, just a, a, an example of um, proteins and protein dynamics that can be studied by many different techniques, NMR, um, NM, uh, NMR, uh, uh, FRET, and uh, neutron spin echo. And uh, using these, uh, we have been able to get a lot of information slowly about very complicated uh, macromolecules such as proteins and their dynamics. This is just to show you an example, not that I'm going to go into detail about this. And of course, um, you know, to study these macromolecular systems are uh, useful for designing antibiotics and so forth. But uh, this, a lot of this work is also done with X-ray protein crystallography, so I'll, I'll skip this for the moment. And now here I, I want to talk about um, neutron sources and uh, historically the growth with time of the fluxes available at different neutron sources around the world. Originally, of course, with the discovery of the neutron, there was just one. The flux was one neutron when Chadwick discovered the neutron. And then, uh, as you can see uh, on this logarithmic scale, um, uh, it, uh, the, there were accelerators that produced neutrons. And then after that, there were uh, nuclear reactors, continuous nuclear reactors, that were higher and higher flux and could produce um, more and more um, neutrons. Uh, and the highest flux reactors um, uh, currently, uh, the high flux isotope reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the United States and the uh, Institute La Langevin in Grenoble, France. And there's also one comparable one being built in, uh, in Russia 
in St. Petersburg in, a, in, in, in Gatchina called uh, the PIC reactor and will be operational in a couple of years. But of course, um, the flux available from reactors uh, has been saturating, as you can see from this curve, because uh, there's a limit uh, to uh, how, uh, how, uh, how much power you can build reactors because the cooling problems become severe. There are also safety and uh, political problems with building nuclear reactors these days. So people have um, now uh, switched to uh, generating neutron beams through um, spallation uh, uh, neutron sources, uh, which you will hear more about later on. And you, uh, you can see that um, the, uh, the flux for these um, actually uh, goes up beyond, uh, uh, to some extent, what you can get from uh, reactors. Here's the spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge. And uh, the, um, the, the source in, in, uh, in Japan, uh, in Tokai, Japan, and uh, here's the ISIS uh, pulse neutron source in England. And then uh, there's a European spallation source which is planned and which will be uh, built soon, uh, within a few years will appear. Now, uh, this curve can be a little bit misleading because it implies that um, the flux of these spallation sources is actually uh, greater than that of uh, reactors. This is not really true. What is really implied is that the peak, since these are pulse sources, the peak flux of these uh, of these sources is actually greater than the uh, steady state flux of uh, reactor sources. And since one can use the peak flux in many time of flight experiments, depending on the experiment, in many cases you have actually the advantage of having a effectively higher flux. But you know it's a subtle uh, thing that requires a lot of explanation to go into to compare uh, reactor sources with spallation sources because they are very um, different things. Um, so let me just uh, uh, tell you what I mean by neutron flux. So a neutron flux is the number of neutrons basically crossing a unit area per second. And uh, so if you put a a, a, a square meter inside a neutron source, the number of neutrons crossing it per second is the neutron flux inside that source. And inside a moderator in a reactor source, typically the, uh, like, as for instance, the Grenoble, the I Institute, the ILL reacted Grenoble, uh, the uh, flux inside the moderator is of the order of uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 15 neutrons per square centimeter per second. For um, uh, 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 for this, you can produce a monochromatic flux after monochromation, which is falling on the sample, which is probably what's relevant, of about 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 neutrons per square centimeter per second. Um, that's what you're dealing with when you when after you monochromate and you want to do a scattering experiment. Uh, in the moderator of a spallation neutron source like the spallation neutron source operating at, uh, let's say, 2 megawatts, um, the peak flux is about 3 times 10 to the 16 neutrons per square centimeters per second. But, of course, the average, because of the duty cycle, which is something like 30 hertz, um, or 60 hertz, I guess, in the case of the spallation neutron source, uh, the, the average uh, flux is much lower. But as I said, you can utilize the peak flux to do certain experiments in the same way that you can utilize a steady state flux in a reactor source. So that is an advantage for, for many kinds of experiments. All right, um, now uh, let's dis discuss uh, interaction mechanisms. So you can study uh, matter using uh, various kinds of probes. Here are shown three kinds of probes, uh, neutrons, photons, which are basically uh, for our purpose uh, x-rays, and electrons. And uh, so um, uh, a neutron uh, will interact basically with the uh, nucleus because it sees basically empty space until it interacts directly with the nucleus through a very short range interaction. 
or it can, because of the dipole moment, it can interact with a, an electron spin in the case of atoms which have uh, unpaired spins and therefore carry magnetic moments. Uh, X-rays uh, scatter from um, basically the electrons and therefore are always scattering because they are scattering by charge. And electrons uh, do the same thing, but they are strongly scattered. And so they are uh, generally, you need to use very uh, high energy electron beams and thin samples and worry about multiple scattering. So we're not considered, we'll consider basically in this course, we're just considering neutron scattering. All right, so here uh, summarize, this slide summarizes some of the properties of neutrons, which as you know, as, as, as you've learned in, in, in quantum mechanics, has both particle-like and wave-like properties. Um, the mass of the neutron is essentially the same as the mass of the proton, and it has no charge. It has spin half and a magnetic dipole moment, which is given in Bohr magnetons here. Um, in terms of, well, actually, sorry, not Bohr magnetons, nucle nuclear magnetons, uh, which are given uh, in, uh, in uh, different unit, EMU units here. The uh, neutron being a particle, in some sense, uh, possesses a velocity, you can think of it as having a velocity, a kinetic energy, and because it's also a wave, you can think of it as having a wavelength and a wave vector, which is 2 pi over the wavelength, and is a vector in the direction of propagation of the neutron. And you can think of uh, the energy uh, as defining a characteristic temperature T by E equals uh, Boltzmann constant times T. And the relations, of course, are just those of since non-relativistic classical mechanics, that the energy is one half mv squared. And so that's uh, KT, which is the characteristic temperature. And if you go to the quantum mechanical wave uh, representation, uh, it's also H over 2 pi, which is H bar K whole squared over twice the mass of the neutron. This is the uh, momentum squared of the neutron, H bar K, where K is 2 pi over lambda and is um, the uh, wave vector of the neutron. Uh, so you can see from this equation that uh, the wavelength of a neutron is inversely proportional to its velocity. And in fact, the conversion factor is given here. You can see that um, if you write the velocity in meters per second, uh, this is what the wavelength would be in nanometers. And if you write the uh, uh, wave vector, uh, magnitude of the wave vector, the wave number in inverse nanometers, this would be the energy in millivolts. These are con convenient conversion factors to give you an idea of the magnitudes of the wavelength and the energies of uh, thermal neutrons, cold neutrons, and what we call hot neutrons. So cold neutrons, which are generally produced in a cold moderator in the neutron source, have energies typically between 0.1 and 10 millivolts. Characteristic temperatures are between 1 and 120 degrees Kelvin, and wavelengths between 0.4 and 3 nanometers. For instance, um, uh, a, um, a neutron of energy of uh, wavelength uh, 0.4 nanometers or uh, 4 ang uh, sorry, uh, yes, 0.4 nanometers or 4 angstroms. I tend to think in angstroms, so I always get a little confused with nanometers, but a neutron of wavelength 0.4 nanometers has an energy of 5 millivolts. That's the typical conversion factor. And a thermal neutrons, which are produced in a, uh, a moderator, a normal moderator with, without a cold source, they range in energy from 5 to 100 millivolts because their spectrum is governed by uh, the Maxwellian spectrum characteristic of the moderator temperature. And uh, so this is their characteristic temperature. And they have uh, uh, wavelengths, much shorter wavelengths between 0.1 and 0.4 and nanometers. And finally, if you put a hot source into a moderator at high temperature, like a graphite, hot graphite source, you can produce uh, uh, high, uh, what are called hot neutrons inside a, a reactor, say, with these energies and these temperatures and even shorter wavelengths. But these come, I should say, uh, naturally when you use a spallation neutron source, which most people use nowadays, 
because they represent the uh, slightly under-moderated part of the spectrum, and they're an appreciable number of very high energy neutrons installation uh, is, uh, uh, available from a scalation neutron source. Okay, so um, now uh, just quickly to go through again uh, the advantages of neutrons for um, thermal neutrons. The, as I've said, the interatomic spacing matches very well. The average, um, uh, the wavelength of, of uh, thermal neutrons, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, it penetrates bulk matter. Um, it has, it can be, uh, you can have the hydrogen deuterium labeling uh, ability to make strong contrasts in your sample or selected parts of your sample. And it has the right energy to study elementary excitations by changing the energy of the neutron by its own order of magnitude when it's when it exchanges energy with an elementary excitation in a solid you can obviously measure that energy very precisely uh, for x-rays on the other hand you have to go to great um, trouble to measure a change of a few millivolts in a energy in, a, in an x-ray photon of 20 kilovolts right so with, with neutrons you're measuring a change of a few millivolts in something which is itself of the order of 10 to 20 millivolts so it's much easier to do spectroscopy. And finally, it's scattered by uh, magnetic uh, moments. So um, a few of the disadvantages, however, for, uh, for neutrons are that uh, neutron sources generally tend to be uh, very low brilliance compared to X-ray sources. And so uh, you can't achieve some of the resolution or the intensity that you have with synchrotrons uh, in general, you need slightly larger samples, although with the high flux neutron sources, these limitations are being um, uh, whittled down, shall we say, uh, more recently. You can work with astonishingly small samples at, at, uh, at these high flux new, new neutron sources. And um, uh, you can't uh, make neutron beams very coherent. So a lot of the experiments that are done uh, with coherent uh, light and X-ray beams are not possible with neutrons. And um, uh, surfaces are difficult, but I, I think this, is, this has to be qualified because there's a lot of neutron work being done on surfaces with reflectivity and, and other techniques which I'll talk about. Um, some elements uh, are strong neutron absorbers, so if you have them in your sample like cadmium, gadolinium, or boron, um, it's very difficult to do neutron experiments on those. In fact, these are used as neutron absorbers in uh, reactors and so forth. Um, and cadmium is used in control rods and reactors, and boron is used as neutron shielding. Uh, so if you want to do neutron experiments involving these elements, uh, it's, you, you have to go to rather expensive isotopes which don't absorb neutrons that much. Um, the element, it, it is hard to, uh, to get um, to get uh, a, 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 to study excitations much above 100 millivolts because you run out of high energy neutrons to be able to study this, and because of kinematic restrictions, because energy and momentum have to be conserved together, uh, it is in general with neutrons very difficult to study large energy transfers at small momentum transfers, and this restriction is not there uh, with X-rays. So there are certain kinematic restrictions. But other than that, as you can see, it's, uh, it's a very useful, uh, it has many advantages for scattering experiments. All right, now let's talk about the formal theory. Uh, I will now define what a, what a neutron cross-section is. And, um, and, uh, and uh, so let's imagine that you have a, a nucleus here and a bunch of neutrons whizzing by, as, as, as I said before, most of the uh, solid is empty space and uh, the uh, nucleus is tiny, but when a neutron uh, hits it, it is scattered. Or you can think of a wave, a neutron wave, which is a plane wave uh, being scattered like a wave encountering a, a rock in a pond uh, sends ripples out. And, um, and so um, uh, we define a, a thing called a, a cross-section, which is measured in barns. 
and a barn is a unit of 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. So it's a very tiny uh, area, and so the, um, the nomenclature of calling these cross sections in barns uh, as big as a barn uh, is slightly ironic. Um, anyway, uh, the, um, the um, attenu uh, so if you've got, if, if sigma measures the uh, cross section for uh, removal of neutrons from a beam, the attenuation of a, uh, a neutron beam as it goes through uh, material containing n uh, nuclei per unit volume, each one with a total cross section sigma and a thickness of material T is given by e to the minus n sigma T. And, n, uh, and uh, so this uh, is one way of, uh, uh, was an early way of measuring total cross sections by just measuring the attenuation through matter. But of course, a, a, cross, a total cross section can involve absorption, scattering, and various other processes. So uh, now I want to define what's relevant for this course, which is scattering cross section. So to define a differential scattering cross section, uh, let's consider that we have a, a sample here and a neutron beam uh, coming in and being uh, scattered uh, oops, uh, from the sample uh, into a detector, let's say. And let's suppose the detector uh, subtends a tiny solid angle at the sample called, uh, by, called d omega and has a surface area ds. And the sample to detector distance is, is r, let's say. Now, um, the... Um, definition of the differential cross-section, which is called d sigma by d omega. So sigma, as I called it before, was the num total number of neutrons. Um, well, first of all, I should have defined this. Phi is the number of incident neutrons per square centimeter per second falling on the sample. That's called the neutron flux. So phi is the neutron flux. Uh, the total cross-section is the total number of uh, neutrons scattered in all directions, regardless of solid angle, per second per, per incident flux. So we divide that by the incident flux, and that's the total cross-section. The differential cross-section is the total number of neutrons scattered into this tiny solid angle, uh, d omega, per unit flux, per unit solid angle. So uh, that's the defer definition of the differential cross-section. And finally, for inelastic scattering, we have a thing called d2 sigma by d omega by dE, which is um, the, called the partial differential cross-section, which is the total number of neutrons scattered per, uh, into d omega into an energy interval dE divided by dE, d omega, and the incident flux. So these are the way, uh, these are what we actually measure in a scattering experiment, is the differential, because we count the number of neutrons scattered, and we know the incident fluxes on the sample, and that's what we measure. Uh, the differential cross-section, if we're talking about predominantly elastic scattering or experiments where you don't worry about energy uh, changes, like small angle neutron scattering, or diffraction, um, or diffuse scattering, or reflectivity. But uh, when we uh, want to do inelastic scattering, we have to talk in terms of this cross-section, the partial differential cross-section. All right, now uh, let's see how we can calculate this uh, in terms of a single nucleus. The neutron is one half. Why does it? That's a, that's a question in particle physics. You have to ask the particle physics that. Uh, for us, we just take it uh, that the neutron has a spin, right? That it's, it's, it's one of the uh, properties of a uh, neutron as an elementary particle. There may be more deep reasons to why it has a spin, but those are questions I can't answer. Proton has a spin, too. 
and many other and other particles have no spin, right? So um, uh, this is all connected with. Uh, there are there are theories in in elementary particle physics that uh, that discuss this, but I'm afraid I'm not an expert in that. Okay. Let's see. There's a question here. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, so the first question is: Are neutrons interacting through strong or weak interactions with nuclei? Um, I think the answer is it's a strong interaction. It's a it's a nuclear force, and so it's quite strong, but it's very short range. We'll come to that in a moment. That's a good question, actually. And um, uh, the second part, I guess, is a qualification of that question, which is when forgetting about magnetic coupling with electron spin. Yes. So the interaction with the nucleus is a um, is a strong uh, a strong interaction uh, with the nucleus, and it's a, a strong short range force, which can actually be represented formally in scattering theory for our purposes as a delta function, where we forget all the nuclear physics that goes into that into that interaction. We just think of it as a short range delta function with some constant in front of it. Um, okay, some, another question is, how is the spallation source different from a reactor? Uh, well, uh, the spallation source, first, a reactor is a steady state source. It's on all the time and the neutron flux is continuous. A reactor, uh, a spallation source takes a pulsed beam of uh, proton pulses and which smash into a spallation target, which produces neutron pulses by a spallation reaction, which are then moderated. So pulses of um, moderated neutrons come out with a large high energy tail. And you'll hear more about that in, uh, in further lectures uh, by other lecturers in this course. And finally, uh, there's another question. Can you compare d sigma by d omega to the Rayleigh factor in visible light scattering. Uh, yes, in fact, um, uh, Rayleigh scattering, uh, uh, for instance, in X-rays or light, uh, can also be expressed exactly uh, in terms of uh, uh, d sigma by d omega as well. Uh, but um, if you like, I can do that later. But uh, but the answer to that is basically yes. OK, maybe uh, we should continue and uh, go on now. So thank you for the questions. They're, they're good questions and useful. Uh, but let's continue with the lecture. So uh, let's consider now scattering by a single uh, fixed nucleus. Uh, so we imagine here um, that uh, there is a, a nucleus somehow fixed at the origin. And there's a, uh, a, a, a plane wave uh, of neutron beam uh, uh, con containing essentially one neutron represented as a plane wave coming in uh, onto this. Uh, and uh, uh, we represent it by a plane wave e to the um, ikx and um, uh, with unit amplitude. Now, because, as I said, uh, the nucleus neutron interaction is is very short range and strong. It, it uh, turns out that it can be represented by a delta function, which essentially scatters uh, isotropically. So basically, what you ha what happens is uh, when this plane wave encounters a, nu a fixed nucleus, uh, spherical wavelets go out. That's the, the the conventional kinematic theory. So you can think of each nucleus as emitting spherical uh, waves. And um, the amplitude of the spherical wave at a distance r uh, from the source is given by uh, minus b over r. The negative sign is just the convention, times e to the i k r. Uh, k is the same uh, wave number as the incident wave, because we assume that because the nucleus is fixed, there is no energy exchange between the neutron and the nucleus. And so um, this is an elastic process. And uh, this is uh, the form of the spherical wave wavelet that comes out from the nucleus. And B 
the constant b which represents the amplitude of this uh, scattered wave um, is actually uh, called the scattering length of that particular nucleus and is characteristic of the neutron nucleus interaction for that particular kind of nucleus okay and um, all the nuclear interactions and everything have gone into that one number that is important measured measurable and important in discussing neutron scattering experiments for condensed matter okay and um, now um, let's see Okay, so um, let's calculate from this situation, let's calculate the uh, differential cross-section for this simple case. So um, let's calculate the, the total number of, um, the total number of flux of neutrons going out through this area DS here. Um, sorry, let me get my pointer back. Going out through this DS here is given by uh, the velocity of the neutron times the area ds times the uh, modulus square of the wave function at that point. Uh, that's just the general result in quantum mechanics that that's the flux of uh, particles through a surface when uh, the wave function is known. And, um, and since the wave function is given by this form uh, and the e to the ikr uh, modulus squared just gives you one, uh, we get simply um, V times um, uh, DS uh, B squared over R squared uh, here. And remember that DS over R squared is just the solid angle subtended at the, at the sample at D omega. And so DS over R squared is just D omega and V. And this just becomes V B squared D omega. Now you have to divide this by the incident flux to get the um, differential cross-section. The incident flux phi is just the velocity of the neutrons times the incident wave function, which is a plane wave, so that just gives me one um, modulus squared, and so that's just V, and then you have to divide by the solid angle, D omega. So the D omegas cancel, and uh, the Vs cancel, and you're just left with um, uh, d sigma by d omega is simply equal to b squared. So that's the differential cross section for a single nucleus with scattering length b. And of course, since it's isotropic, if you integrate over 4 pi in solid angle, the total scattering cross section is just 4 pi times b squared. So that's the total scattering cross section for a nucleus. And, and um, okay. Now you can see that here is uh, a tabulation of the scattering length for various types of nuclei across the periodic table, including isotopes, as you can see from here and here. And um, you can see that um, they vary randomly and irregularly because they're really governed by nuclear physics. They're not uh, going systematically with charge Z or atomic number like X-ray scattering is. Uh, and so they are sort of random, and they can even become negative uh, in some cases. And, they, and, and one of the interesting cases, of course, is hydrogen, which has a negative uh, scattering length, and uh, deuterium, which has a positive one. It's the same element, basically, different isotopes. Uh, there are also magnetic cross-sections plotted here, but uh, I'm not going to discuss those. So now, uh, armed with this, um, uh, this knowledge that um, uh, a differential cross-section for a single nucleus is, uh, is B squared, or the scattering amplitude is B, let's calculate uh, the scattering from an assembly of such nuclei. They can be arranged in a lattice, in which case, of course, it's a crystal, and you get Bragg reflections, which I'm not going to discuss this because uh, I don't think crystallography is something we need to spend too much time for uh, on in a soft matter course. I mean, this is discussed, uh, I'm sure you've had um, 
exposure to crystallography and Bragg reflections in many conventional uh, condensed matter solid state courses and in X-ray scattering. So uh, we'll just discuss um, uh, in the general case of scattering from an assembly of nuclei, whether they're uh, in an ordered lattice or not. Okay, so here's the fundamental diagram to, uh, to show you how in this so-called kinematic theory where we just discussed interference of scattered wavelets, uh, how you calculate the cross-section for a, a, an assembly of, of nuclei at different positions. So let's take um, one of these nuclei as the uh, origin, uh, and let's consider that there's a, a, a wave front with incident wave vector k sub i coming in on the sample. And let's suppose that there's a detector uh, essentially infinitely far away, so the scattered beam forms a parallel beam going out to the detector. And that's the simplest situation. One can modify this for more complicated situations. Now, in this case, the outgoing beam is defined by another wave vector kf, and this is ki. And now you can see that uh, the, 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 the wave that's uh, essentially scattered from um, here uh, to uh, here, uh, compared to the wave that's scattered from here to here, um, has a phase difference because of the different path lengths taken. And here are the path lengths uh, translated into phases, uh, minus ki dot r, uh, where r is the distance, vector distance between these two nuclei. You can show that by projecting uh, this, 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 this vector on the incident beam and dot producting it with the unit vector along ki, that this is basically uh, ki hat dot r, and since the wave vector is ki, multiplying by the magnitude of k gives you a phase difference of minus ki dot kr. And uh, outgoing, it is uh, uh, has a phase in advance. So here it's lagging. Uh, it, here it's in advance, and here it's also in advance. But uh, so we add these two phases together to produce a. If the phase of this beam arriving here was some number like e to the i phi, then the phase of this beam arriving here would be e to the i phi times the extra phases due to this path length difference and this path length difference, which translates into e to the minus i kf minus ki dot r. Just adding these two together and putting them in the exponential as, uh, so that's what the wave, wave function will look like putting that phase difference in. So this is the phase difference between this wave, this amplitude, and this amplitude. And they're all counted together, and they all interfere in the detector, so we must add them all up. Now, this quantity, kf minus ki here, is actually a very important quantity for scattering experiments. It is called the wave vector transfer. It's the outgoing wave vector minus the incident wave vector. In some cases, the convention is, is defined as the incident wave vector minus the outgoing wave vector. But as long as we, uh, I try to stay consistent, I, I can't say that the other lecturers will use the same convention. But I'm using the convention that Q, the wave vector transfer, is Kf minus Ki. And here's a little vector diagram that shows that. And you can see that uh, here I can think of um, this as being... Uh, uh, this as being the um, uh, essentially the opposite. Uh, here's the direction of ki. So uh, so k the vector minus ki is this way. The vector kf is this way, and so the vector q is this way. So often when uh, you want to find q, it's convenient to construct these uh, little vector diagrams uh, defining the incident beam and taking its negative and defining the outgoing beam and then making a vector diagram to find out where Q is. Okay. Now, as I said, you have to add up these waves at the detector, which I call plane 2, from all the atoms which are scattering, and they all arrive uh, with this um, 
let's go back here for a second. Uh, this is Q. So it's e to the minus i q dot r. And so if I go back here, um, it's e to the minus i q dot r i, where r i is the position of that particular nucleus relative to the origin, times b i over r, which is the amplitude uh, of that uh, wavelet from, from that uh, nucleus, which I call nucleus i with the uh, phase of the reference wave, which is going from some arbitrary origin in the atom and the incident amplitude of the incident beam, A. So this is the uh, scattered, the total scattered wave function at the detector. And this is summed over all nuclei in the system with this phase factors here. Now let's calculate what we actually measure, which is the differential cross section here. And you can see that that's, uh, again, the velocity times the area of the detector times the uh, modulus squared of this wave function here divided by the incident flux, which is V times uh, uh, modulus A squared divided by the solid angle, V omega. And since um, we can write this uh, bi squared, uh, the sum of the will give me a 1 over r squared, and the ds over r squared cancels with the d omega here. The a squared here, uh, from here, the a squared cancels with the other a squared, and the v cancels with the other v. And finally, we're left with this very simple product, which is really can be written as a double sum of all over all pairs of nuclei in the system with the appropriate nuclear scattering length B i B j and a phase difference e to the minus i q dot r i minus r j. So that actually, uh, this is the reason why um, uh, scattering of coherent scattering of neutrons or x-rays is actually sensitive to the positions of the scatterers and from which you get, can get in turn the structural information because of this phase factor that's involved in this. Unfortunately, of course, what we measure is uh, essentially uh, this thing is actually a double product, so it's actually a modulus squared of, uh, of this individual type of thing. So it actually, uh, the phase actually disappears from the cross section. And so this is the, an, another example of the well known phase problem in uh, crystallography. And uh, um, so for the moment, we're not going to discuss, if you wanted to image the system exactly, then you'd have to go to special lengths to uh, recover this phase. You can only do this with coherent beams. You can only do this with synchrotron radiation nowadays or with, uh, with a light. And so uh, we will not discuss it further in the case of neutrons. All right, but try to remember this, uh, this expression here for the differential cross-section uh, because that's the basic result. And now uh, I want to talk about coherent and incoherent scattering. So, of course, uh, you realize that for neutrons, um, the scattering length depends on the, on the, not just which type of nucleus it is, which isotope it is because the nuclear interaction varies from isotope to isotope. And also, whether the spin, if the nucleus has a spin, uh, whether the nuclear spin is parallel or anti-parallel to the neutron spin. So because of all this, in a sample where the nuclear spins are not oriented, which in general they're not, and uh, which may have a random distribution of isotopes, there's a certain degree of randomness in the scattering length B over the nuclei in the system. So to deal with this, Let's write B as the average B. Let's assume for, 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 the, for, for the time being, there's only one type of atom, but it may have different isotopes, it may have different spins and so forth. So there's an average B and characteristic of that kind of atom, and there's a fluctuation about this average, which is a sort of like a random variable as you go through the crystal. Now, um, uh, when, you, when you consider this product B, I, B, J for pairs of atoms, 
you can see that you, uh, using this expression here, you can expand this uh, in this form. These are linear in delta bi and delta bj. And so because this is a random variable which is as positive as many times as negative, this cancels out. And this one, delta bi, delta bj, will also cancel out in general unless i equals j, in which case it's always a positive a squared number which will always be positive and non-zero. So it only exists, its average only exists for i equals j. So therefore, um, this thing actually, delta b i squared for i equals j, can be written down as the um, fluctuation of the square of b, which can be written as the average over the, over the system, scattering system of uh, b squared minus the average of b itself squared. So that's what this is. And so when you put that back in the formula for the, for the, for the cross section, we find that d sigma by d omega is the average b squared times these phase factors here. But the second term, which involves only i equals j, since ri has to be equal to rj, this phase factor disappears. And it's just a constant containing no positional information. And it's just proportional to this quantity times the number of nuclei in the system. And this is called the incoherent scattering. It's a kind of like a diffuse scattering that contains, um, that is not um, modulated by diffraction effects. It's a kind of uh, uh, there for, uh, as a background scattering in general. It can be utilized in some cases for scientific purposes, but in general, it's more useful to think of this term here, which is called the coherent scattering. And this thing is a B bar or B average is called the coherent scattering length. And, um, and so uh, if, when, when, when that's done, the coherent scattering differential cross-section is called uh, B bar squared, the coherence, uh, which is related to the, well, it, it, the coherent scattering cross-section is 4 pi times B bar squared. So, uh, so B bar squared is coherent cross-section over 4 pi. And it can be written as b bar squared times s of q, where we're defining the scattering function s of q as this, as this double, double sum here, which is sigma ij e to the minus iq dot r i minus rj, where these are the nuclear positions. All right. Now, having got so far, let's realize that, uh, so this is, a, uh, this is actually a, a, the basic result for uh, which we'll use for small angle scattering, fair distribution functions, and, and in the diffraction and so on, uh, but not inelastic scattering. Uh, let's go on. Um, now we recognize that this sum, e to the minus iq dot ri, where this is the position, let's say, of a nucleus, or any particle, summed over all particles, is just a Fourier transform of the, dense, the density function of, that, of those particles. And the proof is that rho of q is the integral of the density as a function of uh, position times e to the minus iq dot r. But if it's a bunch of particles, the density can be written as a sum of particles of delta functions of r minus the positions of all those instantaneous positions of all those particles and times e to the minus iq dot r. And by the properties of delta functions, this integral is trivial and just gives you again sigma i e to the minus i q dot r i. So this, this, uh, this sum uh, is actually just uh, rho of q, the Fourier transform of the nuclear particle density. Similarly, for x-rays, just as an aside, <laughs> the light keeps going out here unless somebody keeps moving. So if the audience is asleep, then uh, the light goes out. So I guess they all fell asleep. Uh, uh, Anyway, so uh, the electron uh, density uh, uh, Fourier transform is given uh, there, and that's important for the, the formalism I'm giving you here for uh, neutron scattering is almost identical to the formalism for X-ray scattering. So there's uh, they usually uh, I usually teach these together, but I'm going to concentrate on the neutron part here for this course. The density of nuclei is given by this, where this is the position. The, this capital R sub i's are the positions of all the nuclei, 
add and then uh, s of q is just um, this thing uh, times this complex conjugate that gives us this double sum so it can be also written as the Fourier transform of the density times this complex conjugate averaged over the system now what, what does this average mean uh, the average means that the system can be disordered uh, or it could be fluctuating and it could be an ensemble average or a thermodynamic average or even for a disordered system an average over the system itself because a neutron beam generally uh, tends to be uh, have relatively small coherence so uh, you can think of it scattering from relatively small coherence volumes distributed through the through the through the sample and these coherence volumes do your ensemble average of a disordered system even if it's static like a glass or, or a rough surface or whatever so in any case uh, our understanding is this could be either quantum mechanical or a statistical average of uh, this this quantity this quantity here the Fourier transform of the density of the nuclei times their complex conjugate. Now um, here are some values, uh, uh, measured values of the coherent cross section and the incoherent cross section for various kinds of nuclei, and you can notice that hydrogen has a huge incoherent cross section. Um, and has a rather small coherent cross section. Deuterium has a rather larger cross section, coherent, and a much smaller incoherent cross section. So, if you want to do coherent scattering involving uh, things containing hydrogen, um, uh, it's better to deuterate the sample because uh, you don't get the enormous incoherent diffuse background under your sample, and also uh, you get larger uh, scattering lengths. Carbon is completely coherent because it has it has no spin and very little of the other isotope. Uh, similarly, oxygen and aluminum, these are all fairly coherent scatterers of neutrons. All right, now um, I will talk about pair distribution functions. So um, let's suppose that we have uh, we've written down S of Q. Remember the differential cross section is just the uh, B average squared times S of Q. And S of Q is just the modulus squared of rho of Q. This thing times this complex conjugate. Um, and since uh, rho of Q can be written back again as a Fourier transform of rho N of R, this thing can be written as this Fourier transform times this complex conjugate which can be written as a double integral, double Fourier transform of this form. Uh, rho n r, rho n r prime, e to the minus iq dot r minus r prime, dr dr prime. These are two volume integrals over all space. Now you notice that this average is now, um, uh, this is called a correlation function. It is um, the probab, it is essentially relates the probability that you have uh, density at R to the fact that you to the probability that you have density at R prime. So it's a pair correlation function. It's sometimes called the density density correlation function, and uh, that average is what we uh, this Fourier transform is what we measure in this uh, scattering experiment for S of Q. Now, if you've got a system like a like a glass or a liquid, then in general, because of uh, translational invariance. This average doesn't depend on the individual positions R and R prime, but just on the uh, distance between them. Just a function of um, R minus R prime uh, and, and not of the individual positions of R and R prime. And so, uh, recognizing that uh, symmetry property, we can write S of Q as essentially do, do one integral and call this, this thing here a new variable. Uh, capital R, and so then it's just an integral of B times a single integral e to the minus iq dot R of rho n R, rho n R minus R, which we can also write as uh, uh, the three dimensional Fourier transform function G of R, where G of R is called the pair distribution function or PDF, and is simply essentially this correlation function. The density at R. Uh, times the density at a distance 
capital R away, averaged over all initial positions, little r. So it's Im imagine that you take um, uh, uh, two points in the sample over a fixed distance uh, apart and average this correlation over the whole sample, keeping that distance constant. And that's a function of that distance, and that's g of r. So it's actually the probability that given a particle at r, there is one at a distance vector r from it per unit volume. Now, of course, here is a plot of g of r, and you can see that, of course, if there's a particle at the origin, uh, there's almost there's a certainty that there's a particle at the origin, right? So there's a delta function at the origin because given that there's a particle there, there has to be uh, a particle there in the definition of g of r. So we can define it as uh, break it up into a delta function of r. Um, times uh, 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 a g d of r, which is the, g, the fair distribution function for other atoms other than the one selected. And they go like uh, in this oscillatory way, uh, corresponding to, if you like, short range order or shells of neighbors and so forth. As you go out, they become more and more for a disordered system like a liquid or a glass that eventually uh, settles down to just a constant value which is the, related to the average density of the, of, the, of the system, right? So that's what G of R looks like. And um, what we are measuring is its, is its Fourier transform. So what we actually measure uh, is S of Q, which is the Fourier transform of this. We measure this thing. And um, the delta function gives you a 1. And the rest of it gives you the thing so it goes to 1 at uh, very large values of q, and it, uh, you have to subtract off this 1 uh, to get the reverse, uh, to get gd of r, which is the reverse Fourier transform of uh, s of q minus 1. This is normally called the pair distribution function, where you talk of distinct atoms from the, from the one considered. And if you've got an isotropic system, which you may not have, if you've got bond orientational order or something, you may not have an isotropic system. If you've got um, an isotropic system, then uh, you have, uh, you can write this three-dimensional Fourier transform in terms of a one-dimensional integral, uh, sine qr over qr, q squared times s of q minus one. And so if you measure this, you can do this integral and obtain g of r. Of course, there are limitations that you'll hear discussed later on when people talk about the PDF method because you never really measure s of q out to infinity and there are truncation errors and approximations and so forth because you never have a complete set of data but um, you can get a, a reasonably good representation here for example is a very early experiment which showed uh, scattering um, um, the the scattering function for um, um, measured with neutrons for uh, liquid um, argon and which is actually a completely coherent scatterer so it gives you and has a, a large coherent cross section so you get a, a, a large peak this is a liquid you get a peak in the a structure factor corresponding uh, if you like to the nearest neighbor distribution and then uh, peaks but if you Fourier transform it uh, you get the following thing you get zero up to you get the diameter of the particle because uh, these are hard spheres, so you cannot have a particle closer than a diameter to the original particle, to the origin. But then it takes off, and you get uh, a large number of particles clustered at a diameter, which is the first shell of uh, neighbors in this liquid. And then you get a second shell and third shell and so on, and it dies off to the average thing. So this is basically uh, what the pair distribution function for a liquid looks like. In, in the sense of an isotropic average. I have to wave my hand so we can get some more light here. Okay, we're coming to, uh, we're coming, uh, we're coming to uh, the end of this uh, course. So let me, let's see, uh, let me just finish with this slide, which says, what happened, uh, the, the thing I talked about involved just a single kind of atom, one kind of scattering length. If you have a, a, a liquid or a glass made up of different types of atoms, like say molten 
sodium chloride or magnesium chloride, then you have to label each type of atom by um, this index K or K prime, and then there's uh, K and K prime, and then there are partial structure factors, which essentially relate to the pair distribution function of what is the probability that given an atom of type K at the origin, there's an atom of type K prime at a distance R. Its Fourier transform is this partial structure factor, and then what you measure is this summed over all possible uh, types of atoms in the system. Now, of course, you can't get this uniquely from just this. So when you've got different types of atoms, you have to go to some, uh, some lengths to try and extract all of these. So if you have two types of atoms, there are three such functions, S11, S12, S22. And you need three measurements to get this. And uh, you can do that by measuring the X-ray structure factor, the neutron structure factor, and then maybe uh, change an isotope uh, and uh, change the scattering length and get X-ray information that way. But we won't go into these details uh, here. OK, so I think having talked uh, uh, up to this point, uh, I had a lot more slides, I guess. I thought I'd be able to cover a lot more material in my first uh, lecture, uh, but I will cover that in my second lecture. I'll cover small angle scattering and reflectivity. So at this stage, um, I will stop here and thank you for your attention. And I think for the next five minutes or so, uh, until the time runs out, we're open for questions either, either by um, orally or uh, or on the, uh, through the chat space. So please uh, go ahead. And I'll be watching the chat space and also listening. OK, so the question asked here by one of my students in this room is, what is the typical coherence volume of a neutron beam? So a typical neutron coherence length is of the order of uh, maybe a few hundred angstroms in general. So you take the cube of that and it's a pretty small volume. So uh, the reason why it's small is because if you go very far away from a neutron source to make it more and more, to increase the coherence length, uh, as, as all radiation increases coherence length if you go far away from the source, uh, and also neutron sources tend to be big, um, then uh, you have, you're, because of the low brightness, you're left with very few neutrons. So you can't make coherent neutrons it's very easy. Pardon? Uh, well, a typical neutron source that you're looking at may be uh, of the order of uh, several square centimeters. That's the moderator you're looking at. OK, uh, sorry, another question, yes. So, um, so you, you, you know about diffuse scattering for X-rays, right? So uh, think about incoherent scattering of neutrons as just diffuse scattering due to the disorder in the nuclear isotopes and the spins, OK? And the coherent scattering is the average scattering. OK, let's look at the questions here. Um, no questions from Akron. And there's another question here. When scattering with a fixed nucleus, it's point-like. What's the cross-section then? Well, actually, um, so what is the cross-section if you've got a point scattering, scatter? That's actually the assumption I made in deriving the cross-section. I assume that the, nu the nucleus isn't really a point scatter, but it can be effective because of a very small size of the nucleus, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Uh, it can be considered as a, a point scatter and a delta function interaction. And so the spherical wave of the form B over R e to the i k r, and and the cross section relating to B squared, is in fact the cross section for a point scatter because in in the approximation that I'm talking about here, which is good enough for all neutron scattering, all nuclei are point scatterers. Okay. Um, okay. So anything else?
Hello. Yes. There's a oral. Um, yeah. There's a oral, uh, an oral question here. Oral question here. Yeah. yeah. This is from Colorado School of Mines. Uh, yeah. We have a question. What is the difference between coherent and incoherent scattering? Okay. So. Okay. Uh, uh, so here. So. Uh, if you think uh, of uh, the think fact that nuclei uh, uh, are not all uh, the same and you may have disorder due to isotope, isotopic disorder or spin disorder in the nuclei that are scattering the neutron, then means that there is a certain degree of randomness in the scattering lengths. And the incoherent scattering is, if you like, the diffuse component of the scattering due to this disorder. whereas the coherent scattering is the average scattering where you assume the average scattering uh, length from each nucleus as if it's scattering the same amount. Those can add up coherently to give you the coherent scattering. So coherent scattering is used for getting structural information. Incoherent scattering in general provides uh, just a diffuse background, but for inelastic scattering, it can sometimes be used to study diffusion and other properties that you may be taught later in this course. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, I'll read. How do you correct for the fact that nuclei in matter aren't fixed? Okay, that's a good question. In general, of course, uh, nuclei and matter are going to uh, uh, vibrate or recoil when they are uh, scattered, when a neutron scatters from them. This will be taken into account when we consider inelastic scattering. Okay, But actually, even in such cases, there is a large component of the scattering that stays purely elastic. And that's, if you like, because the whole sample takes up the recoil. And since the sample is macroscopic, you can assume that that scattering is elastic. So there is a, a component to the scattering that is purely elastic. And then there's components to the scattering which are inelastic. And they take up all the recoil effects and the fact that the nuclei are not fixed. The fact that there can be phonons or, um, or uh, diffusion of atoms moving in a liquid and so on. All that is taken account in... Uh, inelastic or quasi-elastic scattering. But uh, the elastic component is what I was talking about here. We'll talk about inelastic scattering later. OK, there's another question. When scattering with hydrogen, similar weight uh, as neutrons, is that still as elastic scattering? Well, no, of course. Um, if you consider the hydrogen, the proton, as being a free nucleus, then there will be um, considerable inelasticity to that scattering. Uh, but as I said before, if you put all these uh, atoms together in a solid or in a sample or a liquid with strong interactions with each other, then there is still a component of the scattering which is elastic, as if all the nuclei are fixed. And then you can systematically expand the rest of the scattering, uh, which are the inelastic terms, which take into account the non-fixed nature of the protons or the things that are doing the scattering. You'll see how that goes when we do an expansion of the uh, scattering cross-section in terms of elastic and inelastic terms. Um, could we could we have copies of the slides? Uh, Mayun, I think, will you can download these slides later on after they've been suitably edited to the point where I got to today. It'll be on the course website, so if you're registered, you can download uh, it at your leisure. Sure. OK, so uh, there's a question here uh, about scattering from electrons. I talked about scattering from nuclei. The way neutrons get scattered by electrons is through the magnetic interaction, because the electron carries spin, if you have unpaired electron spin on an atom or a magnetic moment, then the neutron will be scattered by that magnetic moment. There certainly is a strong scattering due to that. And this is called, uh, there's a whole area of magnetic neutron scattering. 
But we are, since this is a soft matter course, uh, I don't deal with magnetic scattering here because it's not really relevant to the topic of this course. It was covered in a previous web course we did last year, uh, which was quantum uh, condensed matter physics, neutron scattering. Their magnetic scattering was discussed. So anyway, uh, I'm sure there'll be many other places you can see about magnetic neutron scattering. Is the scattering from electrons coherent or incoherent? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, the scattering length uh, from a magnetic atom, from a particular magnetic moment, is proportional to the magnetic moment. So if the magnetic moments are varying randomly through the system, if you've got a distribution of magnetic moments, um, then, of course, there will be uh, we don't call it incoherent scattering, we call it diffuse scattering, but there is a similar diffuse scattering component to the magnetic scattering of neutrons when there are not a series of completely ordered identical moments on every atom, like you have in a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet where everything is ordered. You can have disorder, spin disorder, uh, uh, moment disorder, and all of this will give you uh, an incoherent like uh, background or diffuse scattering as we call it, magnetic diffuse scattering, spin diffuse scattering. Well, um, if there are no other questions, maybe uh, we can uh, call it a day. I uh, thank you all for your attention and uh, I hope to see you on uh, Thursday. Okay, thank you very much.